This episode is brought to you by Brilliant. Click the link in the description below. When building a house, homeowners have several ways to power their heating and cooling systems, like oil, natural gas, or electricity. But there's another option that's right below our feet. You can install geothermal heating and cooling at your home. But is it worth the cost, and how does it hold up? I'm Matt Farrell. Welcome to Undecided. Heating and cooling systems are an essential part of our homes, but it comes at a cost. According to the 2021 Annual Energy Outlook from the EIA, space heating represents 15% of total household electricity here in the US, while space cooling accounts for 16%. So together, they share about 31% of the total electricity use in the country. But that's going to vary based on the region. Along with electricity, the main heating fuels are natural gas and oil. Now, while oil usage is low across the US, it's still, sadly, widely used here in the Northeast where I live. And we're talking about 81% of all heating oil is used in this region. But thankfully, one alternative that's slowly getting steam is using geothermal energy directly from the ground to heat and cool your home. If you're interested in how geothermal energy is used to produce electricity, I have a video on that topic too. Geothermal systems have been in place since the 1940s, initially providing water heating. But with the technology's evolution, these systems have been used for different purposes such as electricity generation and heating and cooling systems, also known as ground source heat pumps, or GSHP, which take advantage of the ground's stable temperature to provide heating and cooling. Basically, a geothermal heating system is made up of fluid-filled tube loops to exchange heat with the soil, and a heat pump that removes the heat from that fluid, concentrates it, and then transfers it to the building using ductwork. That part looks pretty familiar to any other forced air heating system that you've probably seen. The heart of a geothermal heat pump is made up of a heat exchanger, a compressor, and a control system that regulates the process. The fluid that's used can range from groundwater to a water mixed with antifreeze or another suitable refrigerant that circulates throughout the ground loops. But to understand that heating and cooling process, it's important to know that heat always flows from a higher temperature fluid or body to a lower temperature one. For example, when you put an ice cube into a glass of water, it melts, right? That's because the water has a higher temperature and more heat than the ice cube. So the heat is transferring into the cube, which causes the ice to heat up and melt. So taking that back to the heat pump, during the winter, the temperature underground is higher than the surface air. So the cool liquid traveling from the house down inside the loops absorbs heat from underground, bringing it back up into the house. And the heat pump compresses the liquid, increasing the liquid's temperature, which warms the air. And the warmed air is circulated around the house and exchanged with the cooler air. The cooled liquid from this process is pumped back into the ground to continue the cycle, forming a closed loop. In the summertime, this process is reversed. The lower temperature refrigerant absorbs heat from the house, which now has a higher temperature than the underground, so it's the exact same principle. The heated liquid transfers heat from the house into the ground and returns back up into the house, cooled off. Now, geothermal systems can be split up into several subcategories, the simplest of which are open-loop geothermal systems. They use an open-ended pipe to pump up groundwater, which is much closer in temperature to the surrounding ground. The water passes through heat exchangers within the heat pump and then back into the ground, but this time at a distance from the intake point. Now, this type of system takes a lot of care because you have to make sure that the intake water doesn't damage or clog up the pump or heat exchanger. On top of that, in some locations, there are environmental regulations that require that the output water has to be treated before it's being discharged back into the ground. Sediment and contaminants from the groundwater can clog up and wear down the system, which doesn't happen in a closed loop system since the refrigerant flows through the loop without actual contact with the groundwater. All of this makes these systems more expensive to maintain, have a shorter lifespan, but they do have a lower upfront cost and excellent efficiency. Closed loop systems, on the other hand, are the most common type of geothermal systems for heating and cooling. And while not always as efficient as open loop systems, they make up for some of the downsides. They can be subcategorized into four types according to the orientation of the heat exchanger loops in the ground. In vertical loops, as the name implies, they're vertically oriented and they require several holes to be drilled straight into the ground. The number of holes, their depth, the spacing between them, and the volume of fluid that's in the tubes depends on the soil, temperature variations, and the house's heating and cooling needs. A great advantage of vertical systems is that they can be installed within a very small area. Horizontal loops, just as the name implies here too, are composed of pipes that are placed horizontally in the soil, with the tubing being buried about one to three meters underground, but the length can be up to 120 meters. They take up a lot of room. If the loops are installed too shallow, they can run too cool in winter months. Horizontal loop systems are usually installed in locations with larger amounts of ground available for digging, such as farms, country houses. Like I said, you need a lot of space. There are also slinky coil loops, but not that kind of slinky. 
These are very similar to the horizontal arrangements, but they coil the tubing to overlap itself to save space. So these loops provide the same distance of piping with less area. However, these systems require more coiling per kilowatt of capacity. And finally, pond loops, which are submerged systems that are installed in bodies of water near the house. These systems don't require drilling or digging, which can reduce costs, but the water needs to be deep enough so that the loops aren't subjected to surface temperatures. Geothermal heat pumps are sized in tons. One ton corresponds to 12,000 BTUs and a heat pump with 3.5 kilowatts of power. On average, you need 16 to 23 BTUs per square foot per hour as a standard rule of thumb for heat loss. So in a new American house, which as of 2020 averages about 2,300 square feet, it would require about 36,000 BTUs per hour, which brings us to a three ton heat pump at around 11 kilowatts. Geothermal systems have some advantages that have raised interest for homeowners around the world. These systems can provide significant savings for heating and cooling. They can work well in almost all climates, they're environmentally friendly, last longer than conventional heating and cooling systems, sometimes dramatically longer, and require low maintenance. According to one market-sized report, the geothermal heat pumps market worldwide was valued at $9.5 billion, and is expected to grow at a compound annual growth rate of 7.2% from 2020 to 2027. The residential sector has been a big booster of that and has accounted for 49.7% of the geothermal heat pump market in 2019, with horizontal loop systems being the most common. But like all technology, geothermal heat pumps have some drawbacks and challenges that need to be overcome in order to make these heating and cooling systems more commonplace. The high upfront installation cost is a major stumbling block, which ranges from $10,000 to $30,000 according to EnergySage, and the larger the system is, the higher the upfront cost. If you want to get more specific on those prices, it's hard because it's going to vary based on where you live and the type of system you're having installed. But the ranges and costs for an average open loop system are between $9,000 and $15,000. And for closed loop systems, you'd be looking at between $12,000 and $30,000. And within closed loop systems, you have choices between horizontal and vertical loops. Horizontal being between $12,000 and $25,000 and vertical loops being between $15,000 and $30,000. The low maintenance and lower upfront cost of a closed loop horizontal system is why they're the most common type sold. And these costs are pretty comparable in other areas of the world from what I've seen. I found some UK prices that fell pretty much in line with these. To put those prices in perspective, the average installation cost for a traditional HVAC system here in the US ranges between $6,800 and $12,000, including the new ductwork, new central air conditioner, and a new gas furnace. Replacing an HVAC system without new ductwork costs between $4,800 and $9,300, depending on the home size and equipment used. Now, although the upfront cost of a geothermal system might be higher than a conventional HVAC system, ground source heat pumps are much more efficient than traditional heating and cooling systems. They can achieve a coefficient of performance, or COP, from 3 to 5, which means that for every one unit of energy that is used by the system to power itself, it will produce three to five units of heat for the home. In addition, geothermal heat pumps are certified by Energy Star at 45% more efficient at heating and cooling than a traditional system. In Canada, you might be saving between $600 and $1,440 per year. And depending on your current heat source here in the US, you can see similar savings. The typical payback and savings in the system is usually around eight to 10 years, but keep in mind that these systems have an average 20 plus year life expectancy for the heat pump and around 50 years for the underground infrastructure. In many cases, the closed loop systems could be expected to last between 50 and 100 years with very little maintenance. To reduce those upfront costs, government policies and incentives like tax credits and grants have been used to reduce the payback period. For example, here in the US, the Federal Residential Renewable Energy Tax Credit, which rolls right off the tongue, provides homeowners a tax credit of 30% from the total installed cost of the ENERGY STAR rated system. So a $20,000 system would cost you $14,000 after the tax credit. On top of that, some states also offer grants for homeowners who install geothermal systems, like Maryland, which offers a $3,000 grant. Now you're talking about an $11,000 system. And the company Dandelion here in the US offers a really simple upfront process of getting geothermal installed in your home. They'll evaluate if your home is a good candidate, help you take advantage of incentives, and provide a no down payment loan so you can start seeing financial savings from day one. Their service area is really focused on the Northeast US right now, but will hopefully continue to expand. There's a few other innovations that have been helping to drive efficiency, drive down costs, and make geothermal more accessible. But before I get to that, I'd like to thank probably the best sponsor I could have had for this video. <laughs> Seriously, you don't get a better connection with a sponsor than this. 
When it comes to thermodynamics and learning how heat transfers and works, Brilliant's Science Essentials course can really set you on the right path. It really helped me out. By the end of the course, you'll have a pretty good handle on not just heat, but matter and energy as well. But if that doesn't get your temperature rising, you don't have to stop there because Brilliant has over 60 courses on topics like logic, mathematics, and computer science. And yes, I made a really bad heat joke. They teach all of the concepts through fun and interactive challenges, which helps you understand the why of something, not just the how. It helps to develop your intuition, which is my favorite part about Brilliant and taps into the way I learn. Go to brilliant.org slash undecided to sign up for free. The first 200 people will get 20% off their annual premium membership. Thanks to Brilliant and to all of you for supporting the channel. So there are a few other innovations that have been helping to improve efficiency, drive down costs, and make it more accessible, like dual source heat pumps. Some areas of the world are too hot or too cold for a heat pump to regulate a house's temperature. Dual source heat pumps can heat not just from the underground, but also from the air. They'll switch to whatever source is the most effective at that moment, achieving a higher efficiency than a traditional heat pump. They're about two to 7% more efficient than air source and about four to 8% more efficient than just ground source. Smart controls have also been implemented to offer support for the grid as well as reduce their running costs. If properly synchronized, the smart controls of millions of devices, such as ground source heat pumps and electric vehicles, would allow the grid to balance supply and demand. Smart controls also allow homeowners to utilize suppliers' dynamic tariffs or time of use rates, simply running when the electricity prices are the lowest. Heat pumps from the British company Kensa, for example, can be integrated with smart controls to align heating schedules to periods of low carbon and low cost electricity. Tariffs such as Agile Octopus, for example, publish half hourly electricity prices a day ahead. Therefore, the smart controls will vary those prices and synchronize them with the household's usual routine, providing the homeowner with lower running costs. Geothermal heat pumps may not be the first pick for the average homeowner who isn't thinking long-term for the environmental benefits, but with further refinements and incentive policies, geothermal systems will continue to become a more compelling choice for the masses. What do you think? Do you want a geothermal system? I know I do. Jump into the comments and let me know. If you like this video, be sure to check out one of the ones I've linked to right here. Be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell if you think I've earned it. And as always, thanks to all of my patrons and to all of you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.